Hey everybody, thanks for checking out United Dry Needlings YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about trigger points. Lots of things about trigger points. Trigger points, a uh, very contentious argument in the physical therapy community. Some people think that trigger points don't exist and the whole idea of trigger points is false and dumb and if you're chasing a trigger point with a needle, you're basically an idiot. And then some people think trigger points are very real and that uh, you can stick a needle in a trigger point and that's the whole idea behind dry needling. Uh, you know, it's a pretty big argument and, and depending on who you follow on social media, that argument is uh, in your face all the time or, the, or you may not have any idea what the heck I'm talking about right now. Either way, that's fine. I'm going to educate you a little bit as best I can. Again, contentious topic, so uh, lots of back and forth. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, trigger points, kind of what they are, and then trigger point theories. And then uh, before we get deep into a theory, we need to t kind of remind ourselves how muscles contract, kind of the physiology behind muscle contraction. And then we will get into the arguments, uh, the arguments for the people that say trigger points don't exist and the arguments for the people that say trigger points do exist. I'm just kind of somewhere right in the middle. I don't know. They may exist. They may not exist. When I stick a needle in things, it usually makes things better. Uh, so we'll talk about that too. And then I'll probably do a part two uh, video that's going to include more of a, well, if trigger points don't exist, okay, what the heck else is happening when you stick a needle in somebody? So we'll probably say that for part two. Uh, for part one though, we'll just talk about the argument. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching United Dry Needlings YouTube channel. If you would uh, subscribe to the channel, that's very helpful. And like the video and let your friends know about us. All right, so you can't really talk about trigger points until you understand what a trigger point is. So we need to kind of define a trigger point. I like to do that with Wikipedia. Why do I use Wikipedia? Because if you start talking to your patient about a trigger point, the first thing they're gonna do is break out their phone while they're sitting there probably. They're gonna freaking Google trigger points. Wikipedia is gonna be one of the first things that pops up. So always get the Wikipedia definition. Myofascial trigger points, also known as trigger points, are described as hyper-irritable spots in the fascia surrounding the skeletal muscle. They're associated with palpable nodules in taut bands of muscle fibers. Thank you, Wikipedia. So, uh, Travell and Simons had a couple of definitions for trigger points. They had active, latent, and secondary or satellite trigger points. So, uh, we'll start there with uh, active trigger points. So, an area of extreme tenderness that usually lies within the skeletal muscle and is associated with local or regional pain. A latent trigger point is a dormant or an inactive area that has the potential to act like a trigger point. So, if you rub around on somebody and you feel this knot and it's not tender, then potentially that's a, a latent trigger point. And if that knot was super tender, then that would most likely be an active trigger point. And then uh, Terrell and Simons also use this term secondary or satellite trigger points. That's a highly irritable spot uh, in a muscle that can become active due to a trigger point and a muscular overload in another muscle. So I told you it's helpful for us to understand the phys physiology that we learned back in uh, physical therapy school, OT school, athletic trainer school, uh, med school, whatever, whatever school you went to. Uh, so it's kind of important to remember some of that physiology because let's face it, we, we all forget that crap. Uh, so let's pretend that we're going to extend our thumb so we can go hitchhiking. So when you want to extend your thumb, there's some neurons that are gonna fire in the back of your frontal lobe in this area called your primary motor cortex. That signal is gonna travel through the brain. It's gonna go down the corticospinal tract in the uh, white matter of the spinal cord. You may not have thought about that word in a while. Uh, after the neuron arrives at the correct spinal cord level, that signal is gonna to transfer to a second neuron that's gonna leave the spinal cord and it's gonna to travel to the target muscle, which for us is gonna be the extensor pollicis longus because remember we want to hitchhike, right? We wanna extend our thumb. The uh, neuron meets with the muscle cell at something called the neuromuscular junction. That probably sounds familiar. And then, some sciencey words here, acetylcholine is released from that motor end plate of the neuron and that's gonna cause calcium to be released uh, in the sarcomere. So calcium is gonna enter that sarcomere, it's gonna attach to troponin, it's gonna expose binding sites on the actin molecule, and that's gonna allow myosin to attach. So you remember your actin and your myosin, they attach. Because of that actin and myosin attachment, that's gonna cause the sarcomeres to shorten. And where the sharp starts, bleh, when the sarcomeres shorten and they're stacked end to end, uh, and they all shorten together, that is going to allow the extensor pollicis longus muscle to extend our thumb, and then we can hitchhike and probably get murdered. 
So uh, there's a couple of theories for trigger points. I'm going to tell you, uh, I guess, my, just my favorite theory uh, and the one that makes the most sense to me. It's not the only theory out there, but it's the only one that I'm going to talk about right now. And that's called the energy crisis theory. This is one of your Travell and Simon's uh, kind of original theories. So something aggravates a muscle. You get some type of injury to a muscle. Because of that, you're going to get some increased calcium release. We, are, we just talked about what happens with calcium that uh, causes a starker mist or shorten. When you get that prolonged shortening, you're going to get uh, a contraction of an uh, area of the muscle. Potentially, with that area of contraction, you can get diminished blood flow. When you get diminished blood flow, you can get something called hypoxia in the area because you get a diminished amount of oxygenated blood flow. The hypoxia will develop ischemia. Really interesting thing happens when things get ischemic and hypoxic. They get acidic. Now, when the environment gets acidic, then things get a little complicated. So the acidity is going to inhibit acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that eats acetylcholine. I envision in my mind that acetylcholinesterase is like Pac-Man. And he's just going around and he's just eating the excess acetylcholine at the motor end plate. So if you have acidity that inhibits acetylcholinesterase, then basically your Pac-Man dies and he can't eat acetylcholine. So when your Pac-Man is dead and the acetylcholinesterase is inhibited and the acetylcholine is not being kept in check by said Pac-Man because he's not around anymore, then you're going to get too much acetylcholine. Well, we know what happens with acetylcholine. Acetylcholine causes a calcium to be released, and then that's going to cause the uh, sarcomeres to shorten. That's going to cause a uh, contraction. That's going to cause a decreased blood flow. That's going to cause ischemia. That's going to cause hypoxia. That's going to cause acidity. The acidity is going to inhibit acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase is going to be inhibited. You get too much acetylcholine. You get too much calcium, and then it's just this little vicious cycle. I think the reason why I like the energy crisis theory is because I get to use big words like acetylcholinesterase and acetylcholine and then describe it as Pac-Man. Uh, so let's have a quick look at a picture there. So you've got excess acetylcholine release. You've probably all seen this picture from the physiology book at some point in your life. Uh, and then the calcium is released. The sarcomeres can contract. That can compress the vessels. Uh, some studies have shown that uh, in an area of compression uh, around a muscle, you can get as little as like 5 to 10% of oxygenated blood flow in the region. Uh, so then that lack of oxygenated blood flow is going to cause some uh, hypoxia. That's going to cause some ischemia. And we know that that can cause some acidity. And we know acidity can inhib inhibit acetylcholinesterase. And then that's going to allow too much just like it says there, excess acetylcholine. It's going to allow too much excess acetylcholine, which can cause a calcium to be released, sarcomere contraction, and then a vicious cycle there. So now we're going to get into some of the arguments. It should be fun. That whole big description about trigger points and acetylcholine and acetylcholinesterase, I mean, all those were big words. That has to be true, right? I mean, uh, Travell and Simons, who basically wrote the Bible for trigger points, uh, that's one of the theories that they used to describe. So what in the world are people that uh, don't believe in the idea of trigger points, what are they using to not believe in the idea of trigger points? So let's get into that a little bit. One of the main things that you're going to see is the fact that trigger points are potentially elusive, that you can't palpate them. Uh, so when you look at this Myberg article back in 2008, so several years ago, but they were looking at the reproducibility of manual palpation, which just means, you know, touching and identifying trigger points based on a systematic review of available literature. If you remember what a systematic review is, they take a time period and then they look at all the research within the time period that the researchers select that meet their inclusion and exclusion criteria. The authors uh, were looking at reproducibility of manual palpation and identifying trigger points. Uh, so they looked at all the research within their time period that met their inclusion criteria, and then they piled them all together. And then they tried to draw a, a broad conclusion based upon all the research within that time period that they selected. So what these authors concluded, that the quality of the majority of the studies for the purposes of establishing trigger point reproduction is generally poor. Uh, more high-quality studies are needed to comment on this procedure. And then the authors state that clinicians and scientists are urged to move towards simpler global assessments of patient status. So that's what Myberg determined. Uh, so basically, he, you know, they determined that those uh, trigger points are kind of elusive. They couldn't really palpate and couldn't reproduce. So then Lucas did a systematic review in 2009, and they were looking at the literature on the reliability of physical examination for the diagnosis of trigger points. And these authors concluded that no study to date has reported the reliability of the trigger point diagnosis according to the currently proposed criteria. On the basis of the limited number of studies available, and I quote, physical examination cannot currently be recommended as a reliable test of the diagnosis of trigger points. 
So you have these authors with their systematic, systematic review. They drew a very big conclusion and said that uh, physical exam, so palpating, so touching trigger points is not a reliable test and you cannot use that to diagnose trigger points according to the literature within their systematic review. And then you got a nice, uh, another article by Lewis uh, et al. in 1999, so you know a few years ago, uh, they were looking at a manual therapist versus a radiologist. So a manual therapist walked in the room and palpated a patient and identified a trigger point, and then a physician walked in the room with a diagnostic ultrasound, and they uh, identified the area, uh, or they analyzed the area that the, the manual therapist palpated. And what they concluded, the analysis of the results of this pilot study found no correlation between the clinical identification of active myofascial trigger points and diagnostic ultrasound. So every time the manual therapist walked in the room, palpated the trigger point, marked it, the radiologist walked in the room and was like, mm, nope, not a trigger point. So the manual therapist was like, crap, let me go find another one. Do, do, do. Palpate around, find another trigger point, mark it. Radiologist walks in the room, mm, nope, that's not a trigger point. So no correlation between the identification of active myofascial trigger points and diagnostic ultrasound. So there's another one that uh, says you can't palpate trigger points. And then uh, probably the main fodder that uh, people against the trigger point argument use is this study in 2015 by uh, Quinter, uh, Bovey, and Cohen. And it was in, published in Rheumatology, uh, a Critical Evaluation of the Trigger Point Phenomenon. Uh, that was in uh, volume 54. So I'm going to quote some stuff out of this article here. We critically examined the evidence for the existence of myofascial trigger points as pathological entities and for the vicious cycles that are said to maintain them. One of those vicious cycles is that energy crisis theory that we talked about it a little bit earlier. So what they found, they found that both are inventions that have no scientific basis, whether from experimental approaches that interrogate the suspected tissue or empirical approaches that assess the outcome of treatment predicted on presumed pathology. Here it comes. Therefore, the theory of myofascial pain syndrome caused by trigger points has been refuted. That's pretty aggressive. Uh, yeah, has been refuted. Hardcore. So, they also quote, however, this is not to deny the existence of the clinical phenomena themselves, to which scientifically sound and logically plausible explanations can be advanced. Uh, I feel like all research says that. Let's do, let's do more to research. But, uh, man, let me just back up and say, the idea, the theory of myofascial pain syndrome caused by trigger points has been refuted. Anyway, pretty aggressive, so... Uh, that's some pretty significant fodder to the argument that trigger points are not real, they don't exist, and the science is total junk and crap. So basically, uh, you got people on two sides of an argument. You have people that say they don't exist, and they're very passionate about trigger points not existing. And then you have people that say they do exist. They are also very passionate about trigger points existing. So uh, let's talk about it a little bit more. The article by Quinter that basically said that trigger points totally do not exist, it's interesting. That was published in Rheumatology in 2015. And then, uh, so that was volume 50, 54, uh, section 3, I guess. And then uh, just three sections later, in volume 54, uh, section 6, in Rheumatology, you had some people that published a rebuttal. So uh, Rathbone and uh, some of those uh, other authors and we'll quote from, from that rebuttal, they find themselves unable to agree with their assessment uh, that all working hypotheses derived from this conjecture have been refuted and therefore the theory can be discarded. Remember, that's what Quinter and his colleagues said, that uh, basically the theory is junk, it can be discarded. Well, in this rebuttal, Rathbone basically disagrees with that. Uh, again, quoting from this article, they agree that the physical assessment of trigger points is inconsistently done and that the literature that examines the integrated reliability of the palpation of trigger points is of unacceptably low quality. However, the low quality research uh, is due to methodological variability and weaknesses such as small sample size, lack of predetermined cut points for the kappa statistic, poor blinding of subjects and examiners, inadequate numbers of examiners, and inadequate training and standardization of the palpation techniques utilized in the studies. Uh, reproducibility, of the, reproducibility of detection of trigger points is not strictly confined to the skill of manual palpation, and that's how the uh, researchers that uh, were in all the studies used in that systematic review uh, were identifying it. That's how they were uh, identifying trigger points. Uh, 
And uh, that's also how that literature refuted uh, the ability to examine trigger points. So Rathbone says that other criteria to identify a trigger point, uh, they say it's just so much more than just manual palpation. So they say some other criteria to identify trigger points are observational, such as uh, identifying that local twitch response, which is when the muscle jumps when you, when you touch it or when you stick a needle in it. Uh, they also say patient feedback or patient pain referral and patient pain recognition or a hybrid such as palpating local tenderness and the patient confirms that with feedback. So palpation, observation, and feedback all combine during trigger point examination to influence examiner judgment is what Rathbone says. And then they also state that if reproduci reproducibility studies do not reflect this complex amalgamation of interactions clearly, the study designs are likely to continue to produce inconsistent findings. None of the studies available for review consider these phenomena together, and uh, therefore there's prone to variability and error. Uh, and I, th I think that's kind of relevant. So uh, you get the, the people that are looking at manual identification, and they're looking at these systematic reviews, and basically they're saying, uh, they, they drew their conclusion that the systematic reviews had such poor reliability that you can't use manual palpation, but you got to wonder the quality of the studies that, that they use in the systematic review. So if the quality of the studies was basically crap that they use in their systematic review that they're drawing these, these hardcore conclusions on, I think you really have to pump the brakes a little bit and determine basically what Rathbone is saying that, uh, well, maybe the criteria that they used for manual identification wasn't the best criteria. Maybe they, they should have went a little deeper with that uh, and that you shouldn't just put a period at the end of the sentence. And then this next article is pretty cool. Uh, in 2007 by Chen and colleagues, uh, they were looking at uh, using something called magnetic resonance elastography. So basically like an MRI, but they're doing elastography to identify uh, trigger points. So they were looking at the ability of MRE, to, which is magnetic resonance elastography, to localize and investigate the mechanical properties of myofascial talk bands on the, basis, on the basis of their effects on shear wave propagation. So that's what they were looking at with the MRE. So what they discovered, chevron-shaped wave uh, fronts in a band region, significantly higher stiffness in the band region than the surrounding muscle tissues, and locations of the band region grossly match with the myofascial talk band marked by palpation exam. So somebody walked in, palpated a patient, marked it, ran the patient through the MRI machine with this MRE, this uh, elastography, and then uh, basically where they palpated is where the MRE determined that there was dysfunction. So what these folks concluded is MRE examination confirms the existence of myofascial talk band detected by manual palpation. So this is kicking it up a notch. This is using an MRI or an MRE, which is like an MRI, but just cooler. Uh, to determine that what they palpated was something that was messed up and, and myofascially taut. If you look at this picture here, the image on the left is, is shear wave propagation is, is nice and, and straight. Uh, if you palpated that, I, I imagine you would palpate that and it would feel pretty smooth. And then uh, we're looking at the upper trap here, by the way. Uh, the top of the image is like up towards the head and the bottom is like the, the scapular spine and to the right would be the, the AC joint. These are two pictures stacked side by side. So the picture to the left would be a normal upper trap. The picture to the right would be an area of an upper trap that somebody palpated that they said was dysfunctional. So you palpate that and it feels gross and it feels like a knot and then they run them through the machine and that's what it looked like. I feel like if I could put on like some MRE goggles when I was palpating, when I would be palpating somebody with an area of uh, myofascial dysfunction or some type of some type of pain or, or some type of knot that I feel under the skin, I feel like that is exactly what it would look like. So that's kind of cool. So something is under there. There's no question about that. Uh, so this person, Weiner, in 2016 reports the trigger points have been reliably demonstrated by MRIs. And then the 2007 study by Chen basically proved that a physician could accurately palpate a trigger point. Uh, so just like the, the Dumb and Dumber meme there. So you're telling me there's a chance, right? Telling me there's a chance. So maybe a little bit more proof. This is an interesting uh, diagnostic ultrasound study that looked at ultrasound and thermal findings. So they looked at temperature. So uh, this is by uh, some people in the Journal of, of Medicine and Life in 2015. So they were looking, is there a correlation between the clinical findings, ultrasound exam, and the thermal pattern of trigger points? They identified trigger points by a clinical criteria, and then they did thermography, so they measured the temperature of the area, and then they did a diagnostic ultrasound to look at the area. So what they discovered were trigger points were represented by a higher temperature area surrounded by a cooler area, probably caused by a deficit in the blood flow around those points. So is that deficit in blood flow causing ischemia and that could lead to acidity? Yeah, maybe so. Uh, it's a small study, but I think uh, it's still kind of relevant because it kind of, 
it kind of goes back to the idea of that energy crisis theory, right? So you got some some heat in the middle, and then it's, it's cooler around the periphery of the area of the trigger point, and potentially that's related to the ischemia, and potentially that ischemia is causing some acidity, potentially that is inhibiting acetylcholine esterase, potentially it's keeping it contracted. Eh, who knows? And then, uh, this one's kind of interesting too, so uh, another argument for trigger point. So Weiner describes a 2003 study by Shaw, which, uh, during which two microcatheters were inserted under ultrasound guidance into the upper trap of nine subjects. So three of them were diagnosed with having an active trigger point, three with what they diagnosed as a latent trigger point, and then three didn't have any trigger points and they were used as the control subjects in this study. So uh, to locate the trigger point, subjects were first manually palpated and then an algometer was used to measure the amount of pressure required to elicit pain. Remember an algometer is you just mash it against the skin and you see how much, uh, top, see how much pressure the patient can take before they yell at you because it hurts. Uh, and then, uh, so they checked that in the active and the latent group. They also checked that in the control group and no symptoms were elicited in the control group. And then, this is where it gets really cool. So then a saline solution was pumped through the first catheter, and then the second catheter sucked that solution out, uh, and that solution was the, the local tissue fluid exudate. And then they analyzed that aspirated fluid. And what did they discover? This is kind of cool. They discovered localized tissue hypoxia, inflammatory mediators, and lowered pH, which was evidence of acidity. Well, that's kind of interesting. So uh, potentially that, that is a little bit of proof for the energy crisis theory, right? So uh, we found some acidity in the area of a, quote, trigger point. Uh, so maybe that energy crisis theory has a little bit of strength to it now. And just uh, when it's all starting to make sense and you're like, oh, I can just totally just kick the people that don't believe in trigger points to the curb, and then I gotta throw this one at you too. So potentially here's some proof against trigger points. So remember the energy crisis theory, we, we just talked about it, the hypoxia, the ischemia, the acidity, the acetylcholinesterase inhibited, too much acetylcholine, etc. blah, blah, blah. It's a little vicious cycle that happens. That all makes sense until you add the surprising variable into the mix. Guess what that variable is? Botox. Uh, so botulinum toxin A, which is Botox, that's a neurotoxin produced by your uh, Clostridium botulinum. Uh, super, super, super uh, deadly bacteria, but we use it in tiny, tiny quantities to uh, inhibit muscle contraction. We also do it to inhibit wrinkles, right? Y'all seen people that have gotten Botox and then they, they raise their eyes and there's no wrinkles, there's no more crow's feet. Uh, Y'all, some of you may have even had a little Botox in your life. So according to these people in 2010, Botox works by preventing the release of acetylcholine at the motor end plate. It enters the neuron, it quickly renders it ineffective, thereby paralyzing whichever muscle the neuron is responsible for. And that's why Botox can be so deadly because it, it can kill you via that manner. So researchers inject small amounts of Botox into trigger points. The neuron stopped working as expected, but the pain and the symptoms of the trigger points did not disappear. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Cottle in 2018 reports that this is one of the problems with the trigger point argument because the symptoms should have disappeared with the Botox injection. Since that didn't happen, it suggests that while hypersecretion of acetylcholine may play a role in the formation of trigger points, it probably isn't the cause of them. Hmm. Now we're just complicating things anymore, right? You know, I don't think we can talk about the trigger point argument without uh, talking about the the trigger point Bibles, like literally the like three, four inches worth of books written by Travell and Simons, uh, over 2,000 pages of the trigger point Bible. Uh, millions of copies are sold. It's still a best-selling book. Uh, I think it's... It's difficult to just completely throw those to the side and completely say that all of the material in these 2,000 pages is total crap because, for one, you can't manually identify a trigger point, and for two, you had one article that basically said that the whole idea of trigger points could be refuted. So I, I think it's a little difficult to, to throw that out. Um, you, it's just <laughs> it's two sides of an argument. Uh, pretty much every everything that... Uh, I, I gave you that shows uh, the trigger points are real. I also gave you a pile of things that said trigger points weren't real. So uh, there's basically fodder for both sides of the argument. Uh, certainly people uh, have a little bit of evidence or have some evidence that says the trigger points are not real and they can stand behind that. And then you have people that can throw this evidence back and say the trigger points are real. Uh, I don't really know what to tell you. You get to, you get to draw your own conclusion. Um, 
again, uh, just the strength of the studies that can't that say you can't manually identify a trigger point. Uh, you know, I wonder about the validity of those and and how much. Uh, yeah, basically, just what I said. The straight how strong those individual studies were. Uh, I know as a as a clinician and as a, as a manual therapist and a, a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist, uh, when I touch a patient, I can feel some stuff under their skin that does not feel completely normal. Uh, there's areas of, of under their skin that is nice and smooth, and then there's areas under skin that has some big old knots in it. Uh, so, are those big old knots trigger points? I don't know. You know, kind of clinically, I've always just said there were trigger points, but. Um, you know, maybe they're not. I don't know, but when I do some soft tissue work or when I stick a needle in them, oftentimes those uh, spots get better or they hurt less. So I don't know. We've been we've been practicing what I did trigger points for a long time. But who knows? It may be it may be going away. We are going to do a part two for this video that uh, basically says, okay, trigger points don't exist. So what else is happening when we stick a needle in somebody? If the whole idea of trigger points is completely wrong, okay, so what else happens when you stick a needle in somebody? Why are patients uh, potentially feeling a little bit better if trigger points don't even exist? So we're gonna look at, uh, we're gonna play devil's advocate for a little bit and then look at uh, what else happens when you stick a needle in somebody. So stand by for that to be uploaded uh, whenever I can get it recorded. And uh, again, thanks for watching United Drain England's YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, like the videos and let your friends know about us at United Dry Needle and Education. Thanks. See you in the next video.